I'll uh, bang my fake, fake hammer here and uh, call a meeting to order uh, with the first item of business, a roll call. Uh, Tony Lewis. Tony. Here. Here. <laughs> Don't leave me yet for that dinner. Scott Miller. Scott, I see you. Ann Oberchain. Present. Heather Williams. Jen Archuleta. Paula Fitzgerald. Here. Trace Baker. I'm present. Stephen Myrick. I'm here. Good evening. Jim Krug, present. First item of uh, business is approval of the December 17th, 2020 meeting minutes. Uh, this time the chair will obtain a motion for approval of the minutes. I'll move to approve. This is Paula Fitzgerald. Uh, Trace Baker, second. Are there any, is there any discussion, deletions, uh, corrections, any, anything anybody saw that needs to be fixed on the meeting minutes? No. If not, let's bring, the, bring it to a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed last aye. time. Motion approved, Meetings, meeting minutes of December 2020 approved. Uh, tonight we have three presentations. Uh, the first up is uh, the 2020 closings. We have Janice with us tonight. And um, uh, Janice, I'll just turn it over to you. If you could allow some time at the end for some questions, I'm sure we'll have some POSAC members with some questions. And uh, so with that, I'll just turn it over to you. Absolutely try to do that. Um, I don't know if you want to see my video, but Nick has stopped it. So if you want to see it, you don't have to turn it on for us. Um, I'm about to show you a presentation, so I'll just go straight to that and um, hope that you can see that. Um, one second, here it comes. Okay. So can everyone see that? Very nice. Very nice. All right. So um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about our 2020 acquisitions and just give you a wrap up of what uh, what we did this year. And just to, um, for the record, my name is Janice Wisman. I'm the real estate division manager for Parks and Open Space. And um, also before we get started, I want to share with you our department's land acknowledgement, which is this. And uh, it's a little long, but I'm going to read it so that I get it right. Um, In the spirit of healing and education, Boulder County Parks and Open Space acknowledges all the contemporary American Indian tribes with ancestral lineage in the state of Colorado, which includes the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute people, whose traditional homelands included Boulder County at the period when the non-natives invaded and seized their land for their own benefit. We recognize all the indigenous peoples that came before Um, non-natives as the original inhabitants of the land and the attempted erasure of those people and their culture by the government our department represents. Parks and Open Space appreciates the thriving and diverse indigenous communities in Boulder County today and acknowledges our need to build stronger relationships with local indigenous people and tribal governments in order to promote their legacy of occupation on the lands that our department is charged with managing on behalf of the residents of Boulder County. And I personally want to acknowledge that I grew up in southwestern Colorado on land traditionally inhabited by the Uncompahgre Utes, which were led by Chief Uray. And I've been living on this land here in Boulder County for 40 years. Um, My job of leading the team that acquires land for Boulder County's open space program is at first glance an extension of the doctrine of discovery that encouraged European settlers to take the land Um, Upon some reflection, our job of acquiring land and protecting it for open space today is actually different in at least two ways. First, we work only with willing sellers, and two, we're working to protect what's left from development. And though this work we've been doing as a community since COZAC began in 1967 shows at least a few decades of dedication to this effort, we are just embarking on the work that we need to do to honor the indigenous people who were here before and who remain. Uh, We're passionate about land conservation so that those who remain and everyone else who has come can enjoy the land today and into the future. 
So uh, my group is pleased as the real estate division to have accomplished a lot in 2020 to protect more land for open space. And we're also proud of the productive year that we had despite the challenges of COVID-19 that made most of 19, uh, excuse me, 2020 feel bleak and harsh, a bit like the blizzard in this picture. So moving on, uh, we invested a net of 17.12 million in 23 new acquisitions. We happened to extinguish the same number of building rights as well, 23. We protected a total of 11,000, excuse me, 1,117 acres of land for open space. 870 of those acres were fee acquisitions and 247 acres were new conservation easement interests. So I wanna run through and just give you uh, some of the highlights. Um, this particular property that's called CenturyLink with no space between the name there um, was formerly known as the level three property. The town of Superior bought this property in June last year for $15,063,000. And Jefferson County and Boulder County partnered um, on a deal that we brought to you in the spring and closed in November to acquire a jointly held conservation easement over the property. Uh, Jefferson County contributed one and a half million and Boulder County contributed $2,250,000. So this partner funding helped the town of Superior accomplish their long lasting desire to acquire this property. And this was the first time that Boulder and Jefferson counties have partnered on a joint acquisition. Uh, this is the Chandler property in Niwot. Boulder County paid 1,250,000 for this property. It actually lies just Northwest of Niwot and just off the diagonal highway. And that car in the distance is driving on the, on the diagonal. Uh, this is an important buffer around, part of the buffer around Niwot, and it's highly visible from the highway if you happen to have a moment to look off to the side. Um, this land is also designated as significant agricultural land of national importance, and it's prime farmland because it's irrigated. And Boulder County acquired 20 shares of the left-hand ditch with this property. And you all and the county commissioners approved the sale of this property to an agricultural producer which we are just getting started um, trying to do. That's going to be a process. We'll sell it subject to a conservation easement to ensure that the water rights in the land stay together and in agricultural use. And when that deal is ready, uh, you'll see that again. Up north of Longmont, Madison Farms is this property and it is um, off of Woodland Road and North 87th. Boulder County paid 2,150,000 for this property. It's a 74 acre fee acquisition with a conservation easement over a five acre house lot that contains the uh, Centennial Farmhouse and some other historic structures. This land is also significant ag land of national importance and prime because it's irrigated. And Boulder County acquired 1.75 shares of the Highland Ditch with this acquisition. Next up, uh, this property is just west of Clover Basin Reservoir on the north side of Nelson Road, just west of 75th Street. And we paid 2.4 million <clears throat> for this property. Um, the city of Longmont asked the county to step in and buy this property and we are partnering with the city. So uh, we plan to sell two house lots. This was approved for us to do and we need to get those on the market and try to sell them this year. Uh, that will bring the total price down and then Longmont will split the cost in half, the net cost in half with the county. And Longmont will own the property and the county will have a conservation easement over it and will also have conservation easements over the house lots as well. And the city is interested in connecting this property to the Open Sky Trail, which is on our AHI Lagerman complex. And they'll undergo a public planning process for this property before they decide to do that. Uh, this property is one of the most exciting of the year and maybe the decade uh, is the Tucker property up north, uh, excuse me, west of Netherland. We paid 3,170,000 for this property. It has an historic homestead on it and we plan to sell that subject to a conservation easement to protect its historic uh, nature. And when we came to you with this deal, we weren't going to buy that historic house and we were gonna just carve off an acre around it and buy 323 acres and leave that house and one acre in the family's ownership. But uh, they have a really large family and they had a, a difficult time deciding what to do with it. So they ultimately asked us to purchase the whole property. And so we went back and got uh, commissioner approval to do that. 
Um, this has been one of our priority acquisitions for many, many years. And because of the large family, it took a long time for the family to decide they were ready to sell it. And we've had several land officers work with the family over the years. And Sandy Duff, who's one of our senior land officers, used her excellent interpersonal skills to bring this deal together at last. And in fact, Sandy closed four of the five acquisitions that I've highlighted for you. So she had a very productive year herself. Uh, we also had a productive year acquiring water rights um, in what we call water only deals. So um, you'll notice in the staff packet, hopefully on the summary page, which I'd be happy to answer questions about later, that I said we acquired 226 shares of water total last year and uh, after I sent you the staff packet and as I was preparing this I realized I hadn't captured the water rights that we acquired with land deals so we actually in 2020 acquired 255.75 shares of water in the Boulder and White Rock, the Good Hue, the Highland and the Left Hand Ditches. Yeah. Um, we, and, and so as I mentioned we closed on 23 acquisitions in 2020 and we had had a five-year vision goal to add 2,500 acres by 2020. And I don't know, for those of you that were here last year, you might remember that I said by the end of 2019, we had already acquired 2,769 acres. So we met that goal last year. And with the 1,117 acres we added in 2020, we added a total of 3,886 acres in five years, which exceeded our goal by 55%. And uh, you may know this as well because I talk about this every year. We're always working on about 80 to 100 deals at a time and our acquisition efforts will continue focusing on our priority land and water acquisitions and trail connections that we need to make. We also closed on seven what we call dispositions. There were three of them that were condemnations or takings for road rights of way. Two were takings by Excel Energy and then this is a taking, this picture shows the CMN Kirsch property as it shows here and along the left side of the picture and the north side of the property is a, a taking by the town of Erie for a new water line. And the interesting thing and that's something that's different about that is that this taking will still have some open space benefit because they plan to build a trail along the, the water line as well. And the final deal that I wanna highlight for you is the sale of an acre at Heil Valley Ranch. And so hopefully you can see the outline there of the Altona Schoolhouse where we've got the white box around that. Um, it was a little tricky. We wanted to support the fire station's need for more acreage. And we had originally gotten approval to sell uh, this property when we got the Heil Valley Ranch 2 deal approved uh, several years ago. Um, and it just took some time for the fire station to be ready to buy this. And then we had some negotiating to do because we wanted to save enough area in between the schoolhouse and what we sold so that we could put in our new multi-use trail. So that was uh, an interesting negotiation. So although it's hard to find good things to say about 2020, uh, we can celebrate that we closed 30 deals and seven temporary takings in 2020 for a total of 37 projects. And our typical pace is 20 to 24. And as you may remember, uh, we've talked a little bit about um, the idea that the board has had a, a five-year goal of acquiring more land and water. So they gave us some temporary staff that we've now hired. We hired this year during the pandemic and got them going virtually. So uh, they've seen the office, but not spent a lot of time there, but they've already contributed, as you can see, to our pace of acquisitions. And um, in other news, just to wrap up here, we um, wanna highlight a couple of other things. Our conservation easement staff monitored 360 easement properties. Uh, that's about 20% more than they can usually do. And so that was impressive for them because they also didn't get started until about June due to COVID restrictions and constraints for safety purposes. Uh, all of those procedures had to be worked out before they could get started. And we made significant improvements to our land and water information systems database. Um, which is our database of all transactional history that we've had throughout our 45 years. And um, actually going all the way back to 1917 when the Legion Park property was donated to the county. Um, we used to have a database that was a snapshot database that would only capture what we currently own. 
And we've been working for about 15 years actually on trying to convert from that snapshot style to a historical transaction style. And we've completed the bulk of that work on the tabular side. Um, we are continuing to work with our GIS staff to finish up tying those records to the mapping system that we have. That's gonna take some additional effort before we can actually rely on the data that's in our database for uh, the metadata behind the mapping system. So continuing efforts, but making great progress. And our department also works really hard to protect open space uh, from damage by oil and gas activity. So of course that can only be done to the extent allowed by law. And since operators have legal rights to use many open space properties and those rights had been leased decades before the county bought the property, um, operators do have those rights and they do tend to be very cooperative in doing what we ask them to do to minimize damage. And in 2020, Brandon Pumphrey um, on our team led our department's oil and gas team in providing the operators with direction on more than 275 maintenance work requests, which um, when you figure out that in a year, we typically have about 250 work days, that's more than one a day. So that was quite a lot. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Good. Hey, hey Janice, uh, not a question, and then I'll, I'll throw it to the POSAC members for their questions, but just a comment. Would you make sure you thank Sandy Duff for all of us for, and, and for all of you guys for the hard work this year? That was a lot of activity in, I will. A, in, yeah. in, a, in a tough year. And then the other comment I would make, and that would be also for the new, uh, newer POSAC members. Usually at the retreats, we've gone into executive session to have some conversation. We don't want to have it obviously tonight about the future, but do that. So if possible, could you put that in your hat? And I'll mention that to Eric at the director's update as well as, uh, you know, maybe one of you that, uh, I'm sure you want to do that, Janice, on a Saturday morning. Yes, Jim, that's, but, that's correct. We do that every year for you and I'm happy to do it again. Yeah, Thanks. and so yeah. That, that'll that answer the questions of what's going forward. I think we can get into it that time. But anyway, thanks a lot. I'll start to, Hey, Scott Miller, I'll start with you. Do you have any questions? Uh, no questions, just a comment that it is, it's impressive with everything, all the hurdles of last of 2020 that you guys were able to, you know, get as much accomplished as you did. Uh, just said good job. Super. Thank Thanks. you. And I highlighted uh, a few staff, but of course we have lots more. So. Yeah. Tony Lewis. I would echo those sentiments, Janice. Nice, nice work by you and your team. Um, I am just a little curious on the conservation easement side. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many acres that translates to? I do. We actually, the county holds about 850 conservation easements or conservation easement like restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, they're not all typically, or they're not all technically conservation easements. And a lot of them are not your typical um, land trust style easement. We have about 250 of those. Mm -hmm. And we've got about, just because I want to get some education out here as well, we have about 130 that we have to monitor every year because they have a donation component. And then we have a rotational schedule for the rest. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, yeah, so uh, the, and that total covers about 39,000 acres altogether. Wow. Great. Thank you. A lot in, you know, Boulder County where we have small parcels. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a lot of, Thanks, that's a lot of and, and do you have any questions? Uh, no questions here. And again, very impressive the amount of work that you were able to accomplish this year. So thank you. And uh, Paula, do you have any questions? No questions, but again, chime in on the good work you guys do. Work. And uh, Trace Baker. Uh, no questions. And Janice, thank you and your staff for a comprehensive summary of uh, your activities there. Thank you. And Trace, I understand you're one of our volunteer monitors. So thank you. Pam, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stephen. Uh, uh, what everybody else said. Good work. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, and have we had Jen or Heather join us? Uh, Jen here. Hey, Jen. Hey, Jen. <laughs> no questions. Uh, just a thanks and a congratulations on 155%. You've proven that working from home is more productive. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Good one. And uh, Heather, is, did Heather join us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, um, and again, uh, thank you um, and for accomplishing so much and uh, the sentiments, echoing the sentiments of the rest of the board. So thanks again. <laughs> you all. Okay. And uh, Nick, do we have any comments or questions from the public? All righty. 
thank you very much, Janice. And we'll look forward to seeing you and crew at the uh, retreat. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. Next up, we have uh, Ms. Glowacki, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about the resource management accomplishments in 2020. So, uh, Teresa, whenever you're ready, please begin. Yeah. Are you seeing my screen? Okay, yep. thanks. <laughs> it was all quiet, you don't know. Uh, so I'm Therese Glowacki. I'm the manager of the resource management division, a position I have held for almost 22 years. And this is definitely one of uh, my favorite things to do is to come to Kozak and share with you all the wonderful work that our uh, division has done in the past year. And like Janice said, I mean, it was Janice had a great presentation on all the acquisitions. Well, once the property is bought, then we take over with managing the resources out there in collaboration, of course, with our ag division and our rec and facilities division and our planning division. This year was a little more challenging. And uh, to start it off, there's a picture of Jana Peterson, who's new county administrator. She's been in the position for about a year. We actually got her out on the properties as a Trailhead ambassador during COVID. So we'd like to um, extend the opportunity to engage with visitors to anyone. You're all welcome to join as well. Then I also wanna start with the native land acknowledgement. And um, this is, Janice read it. I'm gonna leave it up here if you want the chance to read certainly the, the large bullet in the, millet, millet, in the middle there. This is something that parks and open space um, is really starting to focus on. We've had a focus on really embracing our Native American heritage. And we actually have a property that was purchased in the 70s and is called Indian Mountain. And it is restricted to use only by our Native, uh, Native American community members. And it has been used by them for, uh, for many years. And luckily with the help of Jeff Moline, we're expanding that interaction and we look forward to doing more connections between Boulder County Parks and Open Space and the, um, and the contemporary American Indian tribes that still live and, and work here in Boulder County. And we aim to mitigate past impacts on our native ecosystems through this collaboration and through restoration and education. So big, broad picture, resource management division. It's one of the seven divisions in parks and open space. It's one of the larger divisions. We have 41 staff and we have 25 seasonals on a typical year. The work groups that are, that are, that comprise our division are education and outreach, resource protection, plant ecology, weed management, and forestry. And these are our supervisors out here. We do regular field trips to see projects. So these are the supervisors of each of these work groups. And you will see each one of them through the course of 2021 coming and giving presentations on what their work group strategic plans are focusing on. So this is the big picture. And as we go through 2021, you'll get more details from each of these um, supervisors. With education, what trail and, was that? What trail was that? It was um, it was the uh, four oh, what is it called? Fourth of July trailhead, and it's the complex one past Hesse, where we uh, we manage a little sliver of land. The city of Boulder manages the parking lot, and the U.S. Forest Service has a trail, and so it's a project for our rangers. One of our seasonals spends the summer up there managing traffic on our HESI property for parking. Many of you have probably been up there and seen it. We also help manage the shuttle. So we went up there to see the problems in, uh, in real life. So that's where it was, way up high. I'll start with our education and outreach. That group consists of both volunteers, staff, and our staff are broken up into two groups. We manage uh, natural resource interpretation and we manage cultural resource interpretation. And 
if any of you have been fortunate enough to go join us when, when we had uh, public programs like Walker Ranch, where we have living history, and we have the um, Altona Schoolhouse, we have the Lore Agricultural Heritage Center. Those are all cultural sites where we have volunteers engaged in uh, interacting with the public on the history of Boulder County. And then we have our volunteer naturalist program. And that is where we do bird hikes and wildfire, wild, wild flower hikes, wildfire hikes. We do all kinds of hikes. And of all of our programming, we have about 250 volunteers that are program volunteers that come out and do that work for us on the ground, interacting with the public every year. So they do about 85% of our public outreach is our volunteers. What happened in 2020 is all of those public outreach programs were canceled. And so we didn't wanna lose our connection to those 250 volunteers. So we pivoted and our staff were fabulous at this. They interacted with volunteers in a virtual way. They had virtual meetings, they had held virtual trainings, and then they encouraged volunteers to take on the role of creating virtual content. And volunteers stepped up and, and helped us lead the charge. So what you see on the right is a whole list. When you go to our volunteer page, you can see all of these different um, interactive programs that staff and volunteers worked on that the public can now use. We were also able to do 30 virtual field trips because field trips are a big part of our spring and summer programming. And we did offer some of these public programs. The other thing that we're so grateful for our volunteers, what I was just talking about was the interpretation side. We also have a large group of volunteer ranger corps, and that includes people like Trace Baker, who is one of our volunteer rangers. And when COVID hit, we still needed those volunteer rangers to be out interacting with the public because as I'm sure most of you are aware, we had record breaking numbers of visitation. It was peace. It was everyone's respite to our quarantine with COVID. So here's an example. These are three sisters that are volunteers with us in our cultural history program at Walker Ranch. And they created a video um, demonstrating kids games. So when we do have public programming, these are the types of volunteers that are out there interacting with the public, showing them what kids would have played in the 1880s. So they loved it. They got to be stars. They got to create the content and their work will live on because we can use these for future training of volunteers. We also partnered with the St. Vrain Valley School District Innovation Center. And you'll hear this name at least twice throughout, our, throughout my presentation. It's a wonderful program through the St. Vrain Valley School District that engages students, high school students in particular, in real life experiences. And this uh, is a brochure that they helped us develop that, help, that will help be a self-guided tour for teachers who take their students out to the Altona Schoolhouse, which is on Ohio Valley Ranch. You saw a picture of it in Janice's slide from the air. Hopefully you've, I think some, I think we did, I know that you did a field trip out here. Yeah, you know, yeah. All of you haven't been there. But so it's now open to the public when, Pre-COVID times, we could take um, school groups on tours of there, and they would split into two groups. So one group would be in the schoolhouse, and the second group would do a little a nature walk on the schoolhouse loop. So this guide will help teachers do both of those sides of the programming. So we love that kind of partnership. And as I mentioned, we had record-breaking visitation. So just, wow. as an, just as an example, in June, on all of our trails in 2019, we had 107,000 visitors. In 2020, we had 155,000. That's a 45% increase. And some trails were busier than that. Like Carolyn Homer Preserve at Rock Creek Farm. You know, that's a trail that's very close to Broomfield and Louisville and Lafayette. It's very accessible by bike. Um, it's, it's a wonderful property. It's actually where Scott lives and where Scott uh, is the tenant, our ag tenant out there. We went from 7,000 to 14,000 visitors in, in the month of June between 19 and 20. And then the Antelope Trail, which is on the backside of Hall Ranch, we had a 190% increase. 
from 1400 to 4100. So we, even though we have a nice large staff, we still were, were inundated with the needs of park visitors. And so in order to deal with that, we took um, lemons and made lemonade. Since Youth Corps was canceled in 2020 because of COVID, we had all these really qualified Youth Corps leaders that were out of summer jobs and they were looking to keep working. So what we did is we, any of them that wanted to stay on and do some summer work with us, we hired them as park ambassadors. And so that's, that's what you see here. They're jumping for joy at the, uh, at the idea that they got to continue working. And so we had these, uh, these staff based at our trailheads because our trailheads were overflowing. And so they had the skills to both interact with the public about what they might find on the trail, direct the public when the trailheads were full, where they might have alternative parking or an alternative park to go to. And then also um, handing out masks because we wanted to keep our trails open. We wanted to keep people safe. And so we had um, we have a policy that when you come to open space, when you're in the parking lots or passing people, you need to wear masks. Those, so these trailhead ambassadors were handing out masks for those who may have forgotten them. We couldn't have done it without this group of staff this year. Moving on to our rangers, they were the other group. We call it resource protection. They were the other group that were just, uh, overwhelmed, shall we say, with the amount of visitors and what that meant to our systems. And primarily it's, you know, crowded parking lots. But our rangers were out there on patrol with their masks on, on horseback, in their vehicles, on mountain bikes. They have e-bikes that they actually can patrol on and a lot of miles of hiking. And they too helped with our um, compliance on getting the public to wear masks at trailheads and while passing people. And then one big uh, thing happened in October, you may have heard about it. Um, it was the Calwood fire and our rangers were first responders on the scene. So when, when this fire started blowing up and they knew it was gonna be a problem, it was all hands on deck from the sheriff's office. And that means all of our rangers were called to action to help with the evacuations. So they were helping evacuate first and foremost any park visitors that were on the Ohio Valley Ranch and haul trails. So they had to get out there and cover those 10 or 14 miles of trails and make sure nobody was out on the property. They also had to evacuate themselves. So the house that you see here is Kevin Grady. He's our ranger caretaker for Ohio Valley Ranch. And he lives in this house and was alerted, obviously with all of the, the radio traffic, that there was a fire and it was heading his way. So he personally had to evacuate. As he was evacuating, this is the photo he took. And this is the fire coming from the west heading straight down towards his house. Now, what happened, well, in addition to Kevin having to get himself out, we have an inholding on Ohio Valley Ranch and it's owned by the Oaks. And it's several 40 acre parcels and there are four people that live up there. And so our ranger, one of our ranger supervisors, Jason Roman, headed up there to make sure the Oaks knew and were evacuating. So he helped hook up their trailers, tried to get the horses on it and everything to get them out of there. He said this was also the scene he saw as they were leaving. He said it was the scariest day in his life as they're trying to evacuate down this road with the fire barreling down behind them. So our rangers were very, very active. And because of what Jason did, and helping get the oaks out of there, they saved lives because the fire moved so fast. Um, it destroyed one of their homes, two other homes up there did survive. And, um, and uh, one of the reasons, both on Kevin Grady's house, the house I just showed you, let me back. All the green trees on the left, those were all consumed by the fire, but the house itself stood the barn in this picture stood because Parks and Open Space several years ago embarked on a defensible space project mm. 
we got some federal grant money to really harden all of our, um, of both our historic structures and, and homes like this that we own on open space property. And this home and barn survived. It is, uh, it's a testament both to defensible space. And also when you have defensible space, it allows the firefighters to protect the, the infrastructure. So the trees are gone, but the house and the barn are still here. Luckily for the Oaks as well, their main house survived. When Jason was trying to evacuate them, they got a couple of their horses in, but this horse and this donkey wouldn't get in the trailers to be evacuated. And Jason had to yell at the Oaks and say, we gotta leave them, we're getting out of here. And so he was devastated thinking that he left this horse and donkey in the wake of the fire and that they were going to have perished. The next day when our Rangers, Kevin Grady, the caretaker is, uh, He's the one on the right with the glasses. Um, they went back out and accompanied the Oaks back up to their property. And here was the horse and the donkey waiting for him. So it was a wonderful story, um, harrowing on the part of our Rangers, but all's well that ends well. Houses and people's lives were saved. The other thing our Rangers are really focusing on is the county's goal and the parts and open space goal of increasing diversity among our staff and in the people that we interact with. So we uh, hired this year Juan Ocampo. He is a native Spanish speaker. He was a seasonal ranger with us in 2019 and he's just a fabulous, a fabulous addition to our staff. He's great with kids, his Spanish skills, you know, help him be able to connect across, um, connect us with the Latinx community. And as a caretaker at Patasso, he interacts with everyone that uses Patasso on a regular basis. So we are so glad to be expanding uh, and, and helping us reach our cultural diversity goals. And really, this is just a start. This is just a start. Planned Ecology is another work group that uh, was able to accomplish a lot, even in COVID. The nice part about being a plant ecologist is most of your work, a lot of your work is out there with the plants. So we kept up with our normal work out monitoring sites. We, we monitor vegetation for a host of different reasons, including the elk impacts on Ron Stewart Preserve. Uh, many of you know, we started a hunting program four years ago. And part of the reason we did is because of the impacts that so many elk were having on our native vegetation. So we've continued to study that and watch what happens when we exclude elk and when we reduce, reduce the herd size. And 2013 flood, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, that's, uh, that's ancient history. But for us, it's still, we're living and breathing it in our restoration world. So they're monitoring flood restoration projects. And then we get the fun of monitoring new properties like the Zaf property, which is on Hygiene Road. And I'll show you a picture of that uh, a little later on. In addition to just our monitoring for our particular management needs, we also started the first half of a comprehensive wetland inventory. So we're inventorying all wetlands on Boulder County Parks and Open Space. And it's the first time that we are reinitiating this inventory. Our last inventory is 20 years old, so it is time. This shows what, uh, what our monitoring looks like and it gives us hope for hope for the success of our flood restoration projects. On the left, this picture would have been 2018. And it was, this is along the St. Vrain River. It's our Reach 3 project. So it's just east of Lyons um, along the St. Vrain. And this is just after we did the initial planting. So this is our before picture. And then on the right, you can see what it looked like two years later. And you can already see, we've got willows, we've got sedges, we've got um, cottonwoods. The, the amount of restoration was thousands. We replanted thousands and thousands of native plants out in this um, flood impacted area. And it's just so wonderful to go out and actually see the plant surviving, taking off. Um, and we just can't, I mean, it just is a wonderful, wonderful restoration experience to see before and after and such dramatic changes in two years. So we can't wait for five more years uh, to see the changes then as well. 
Another thing that we did is we had um, some ponds up at Caribou. If you've hiked around Caribou, this is in the Deland Meadow. And in those meadows, there's unique plant communities and uh, moose love these wetlands. Well, the wetlands were created by beaver dams and the beaver dams, the beavers left and the beaver dams collapsed just in a couple of spots. So our plant ecology staff um, put on their work gloves and went out there and pretended to be busy beavers themselves. And they repaired the breaches in the beaver dams. Uh, and you can see using stakes and willow, uh, willow switches. And the hope is that by restoring these, the beavers will uh, again find this good habitat for them to set up shop. And our plant ecologist team often are the ones who have recommendations for prescribed fire because we are a fire adapted uh, landscape. Fire is a part of our ecology and we would like to have more fire on the landscape, not necessarily like the Calwood fire, but uh, more like historic fires that wouldn't have burned as hot or as widespread. But we do try to replicate that by doing prescribed burns uh, for habitat enhancement. So this is a little pond along the road as you're going from the new parking lot at Heil to the original parking lot at Heil. And we have volunteer butterfly monitors that, uh, that have been monitoring butterflies at Heil for 17 years. And they noticed that it was getting uh, covered in. And what you see on the left are cattails. It's all dry and everything in the winter, but the cattails are basically crowding out native plants and filling in the waterway. So we went out and did a prescribed fire out there. That's what you see on the right. And lo and behold, we had butterflies return. So a good collaboration between our firefighters and our forestry staff, our plant ecologists and our wildlife biologists. And trans it transitions right into our weed management because uh, getting rid of the cattails was a weed management goal. All of our weed management goals really are focusing on increasing biodiversity on the landscape, whether it's good habitat for the bighorn sheep that are at Hall Ranch, which you see on the right here, or good habitat for butterflies and uh, other pollinators. So what our weed staff focused on in 2020 is really trying to get a handle on non-native annual grasses. And for most people, you've heard of it, our biggest problem here is cheatgrass. So we've been using a chemical called Rejuvra to treat cheatgrass. We, were, we worked with CSU as they were testing this chemical to see what its impacts on native ecosystems would be. These were very small controlled tests on Ron Stewart Preserve. And uh, the results that we saw up there were encouraging. Um, Bayer is the company that uh, manufactures and markets the Rejuvra. They have now gotten um, authorization to use this in native ecosystems. And we helped contribute to the ability to do that. So since it has been approved for this use, we have started using it in a more expansive way because we have a big cheatgrass problem. So this is on the Trevarton property. You can see Highway 36 way up on the right-hand side here. And um, this is a treated and untreated. So cheatgrass, the reason they call it cheatgrass is because it sprouts in the late fall or early spring and it cheats the other natives out of their moisture and nutrients because it grows early. It gets a head start, it grows, it goes to seed, and then by early summer, even June, it turns red. So that's what you see on the left-hand side of the screen is all the red, reddish brown, dead cheatgrass. So that's where we did not treat. On the right-hand side of the fence, we treated. And what you can see is there's no more cheatgrass and you can see a larger diversity of natives out there. We didn't do any planting, we didn't have to. What we found is that as long as you control the cheatgrass, the natives really take off. So it is a, um, it's of a special interest to many people who are trying to manage cheatgrass infestations in the West. And it's over 5 million acres are infested with native annuals. And we've got part of that on our own property. So here are before pictures from Indian Mountain. That's the property I mentioned at the very beginning, which is really dedicated solely for Native American use. 
Hall Ranch on the top right, Rabbit Mountain, and then the Colt property, which is just on the east side of Highway 36 and Nelson Road. So they went from monocultures to high quality pollinator habitat. So again, Indian Mountain, we have um, just a flush of Mexican hat on Hall, Rabbit, Tree Varden, um, two different spots on Rabbit. What we have seen is when you eliminate the cheatgrass, you just have a flush of natives. We did comparison studies, and in one um, case, we saw an 18% increase in natives. And we've also worked with CSU studying the pollinators, because when you have a monoculture of cheatgrass, the pollinators don't have anything to find nectar, find nectar or pollen on. When you take the cheatgrass competition away and you have this diversity of natives, the pollinator, um, the quantity and variety of pollinators significantly increases. So this has multiple, multiple impacts. And one final thing, we just started a research study this year with CSU looking at the carbon sequestration benefits or changes from going from a cheatgrass infested landscape to back to a natives. So, so there are so many um, positives that we are seeing with the use of this very, very, very targeted chemical for cheatgrass. And then something we didn't, we didn't really expect, but even in the face of the Calwood fire, what you see on the left is the picture where it was, it was cheatgrass infested and it burned everything. And then on the right, you can see first the darker area on the left side of the picture on the right is where the cheatgrass was. And in the center is where the cheatgrass had been treated. So it had more natives. And you can see that the burn was, um, was more spotty in the area where it wasn't a monoculture of dried cheatgrass. So it even has wildfire implications, good implications. So the other big thing we did is since we have found this to be so, um, so successful in helping us restore natives, we did an aerial application and this was about a week after the shutdown because of COVID. So this was mid-March and we did a helicopter aerial application of Rejuvra on the Overland Burn. So this is at Heil Valley Ranch as you're heading um, up to the main trailhead. If you look off to the left, that's where the Overland Burn was and we had a lot of cheatgrass in there. So we sprayed about 240 acres with this helicopter application. And we are hoping indeed that getting it down before the Calwood fire, that we are gonna have much better regeneration of natives as spring rolls around in these burned areas. And we are definitely gonna be studying that. So speaking of helicopters, in our forestry work group, we completed a large scale helicopter logging project also at Ha Valley Ranch. There were a lot of helicopters at Ha last year. This was a 162 acre project and it was funded, it was not cheap. It was $1.3 million funded by a combination of FEMA, the State Forest Service and Parks and Open Space. And basically what happens is they send a crew out and they cut their trees down. And then there's a crew that um, takes a chain and hooks the trees together. So the helicopter flies over they, with these trees that are chained together, they hook it to the long, uh, you can see the long chain from the helicopter. The helicopter lifts them, takes them over to the landing and then goes back for another load of trees. And this is something that we use only where it's too steep to get regular ground equipment because it is significantly more expensive. It's also lighter on the land. So we are, uh, so when we can, when we do have the funds, this is an appropriate use in particular areas. Another um, connection back to uh, working with the Native American tribes here in Boulder County, um, Jeff, Moline and Zach Price. So Zach is one of our foresters and you know Jeff, he's a manager for their planning division. They worked with the Indian Mountain Group and this is Mr. Wesley Black Elk. And we had a large project at Reynolds Ranch in 2019 that we saved a couple of acres aside so that we could harvest lodgepoles for our own internal parks and open space projects, like our fencing projects and our restoration projects. And as we were working on that, 
um, we found out that the the Native American group was looking for teepee poles. Well, guess what lodge poles were used for before we were here, before white folks were here, and it was for teepee poles. So we combined efforts and um, will be providing teepee poles to um, the Indian Mountain Group. We also did some collaborative work, which we try to do regularly. Uh, you, I'm, most of you are aware that we have a new six mile trail corridor down on the Tolan Ranch that we are working on getting the trail put in. Well, the first step of getting a trail put into a high mountain terrain like this is clearing the trees so that you can actually carve in a trail. And the trees up at that elevation, this is above um, Eldora. You can access this through the Eldora parking lot. That's how our foresters got in there. And then it's gonna um, go out on West Magnolia. That's the exit of the trail. So six miles of trail corridor are foresters and we use the park ambassadors during the week when the trailheads weren't so busy. And we cleared the hazardous trees and the trees infested with dwarf mistletoe and mountain pine beetle. And we cleared the area. So on the bottom right, you can see what it looks like. So, so our trails crew can get in there now and actually um, construct the trail. So the trail isn't completely done, but the corridor is cleared. In our wildlife working group, we always have a number of um, irons in the fire, that's for sure. And we partner with CPW, with US Fish and Wildlife, with Trout Unlimited on a host of different projects. But this was a new one for us. So uh, back to our elk issue where we have so many elk at Rabbit, at Rod Stewart Preserve at Rabbit Mountain and the feeder canal crosses through Rabbit Mountain. And what happens is the elk, as they would be trying to move from east to west on our property across the feeder canal, unfortunately, periodically, an elk would get stuck in the canal. You can see it's got steep walls and it's cement and the elk would perish. And that caused problems for Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. They'd have to go and remove the elk from the canal. And, and it certainly isn't good for an elk to perish in that way. So we partnered with them to construct some elk crossings over, over the canal. Um, and it's something that we are looking bigger and broader at, other sorts of wildlife crossings that some of you may have seen in Western Colorado, but, uh, but animal wildlife, but wildlife crossings, whether it's a canal or a road are important in our um, overall goal of providing migrating corridors for wildlife. So I mentioned early on the new property acquisition of uh, along the St. Vrain, the ZAF property. Our wildlife staff were thrilled when we purchased it. It is a land of many uses, that's for sure. There's an old farmstead out there. There is the south branch of the St. Vrain River goes through there. It has an, one of the oldest apple orchards in the county on this property. And it has a potential for a trail corridor, a connection when we do Longmont to Lyons Trail, it's in our trail plans. But our wildlife staff were particularly excited because it is a, was a missing puzzle piece in our Prebles habitat. We had Prebles upstream of it and downstream of it. So we have a multidisciplinary parks team working on the property, trying to get management on the ground. And one of the first things that they came up with was um, excluding grazing in the riparian habitat, in the riparian area. So what excluding grazing will do is it'll allow shrubs to get established. Um, and shrubs and woody vegetation increases carbon sequestration. By removing cattle grazing in riparian areas, we also can improve the water quality. And what we found even in the first year is that Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse found it as a good habitat. Mm -hmm. In our first year of trapping, we captured 25 mice, 25 Prebles out on the ZAF property. So already um, it's looking very positive on where what the trajectory of this property will be. So in the same vein with Prebles, uh, we started working with a multidisciplinary team, including U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, 
city of Longmont, the ditch owners on a Prebles species conservation team. So here are the cute little mice. When we trap them, we have to do all kinds of uh, analysis on them. They weigh them, they measure them, they uh, determine whether they're male or female, whether they're lactating. So we collect all that information what we have found through our five years of Preble studies is that the Preble's population along the St. Vrain is perhaps the largest concentration of Preble's in its habitat. And Preble's is the threatened and it's a threatened species under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And it's the threatened mammal we have in Boulder County. So it is a very high priority for us to expand its habitat and um, that's what our creek restoration projects, both the earlier stuff I showed you about Reach 3 and the flood restoration, in addition to um, changing our management practices on a property like Zaf. And our wildlife staff also did a wonderful project with uh, raising a threatened and endangered fish called the Northern Red Belly Dace. This was a collaborative project between Oceans First, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the St. Vrain Innovation Center, um, Boulder County, Trout Unlimited, and we raised these fish. We took uh, eggs, raised them in tanks. It started at the St. Vrain School District, but then COVID hit and school shut down. So it was our wildlife biologist staff that helped, uh, that transferred the tanks to his home, it's Matt Kobza, and raised the fish. So I'm not gonna give a whole lot more detail because he's gonna come and give you the whole story next month. But it is such a cool collaborative project that we're so we're just so thrilled to be working on restoring a threatened species right here in our own backyard. And then the Calwood fire. So we all know October 17th, that's, that's when it struck and it burned basically 10,000 acres in uh, seven hours. And it left in its wake a lot of dead trees on Ohio Valley Ranch. This is the map. I think that you may have seen it uh, when Stefan came just after the fire. This just gives you the visual. The red line is the perimeter of the fire and the green is our typical green open space properties. So about half of the fire was on Ohio Valley Ranch and parts of our conservation easement. The lime green is our conservation easement. So since we presented that to you in October, we've been working on the soil burn severity and the debris flow modeling and flood potential. And so we are now really uh, embarking on what we are going to do for restoration on on Ohio Valley Ranch and our conservation easements. And what it's gonna look like is aerial mulching. So we've had helicopters on Heil for forest thinning, for spraying weeds, and now we're gonna have them out there for dropping aerial wood chips, wood chips, um, dropping them from helicopters on Ohio Valley Ranch to help stabilize the soil so we don't have major flooding. And this is what it looks like. Get the helicopter, they load up the um, the mulch fly over the burned area and drop it out with the goal of covering about 70%. And unfortunately, we've had this experience before. This is our fourth time, <clears throat> fourth fire and fourth time we will be um, embarking on a major uh, recovery effort after a fire, but this one dwarfs the other ones. The other ones, oh, 600 acres, um, maybe 2000 acres. This is a 10,000 acre burn. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions you might have. And I'll also um, ask if there are any projects you want to see. Hopefully we'll be out of COVID and be able to go out to the field in the spring and summer and fall. If there are projects that piqued your interest that you want to go see in real life, we'd love to take you on field trips. Hey, uh, Trace, we'll get, yes, thank you very much. Uh, hey, gang, we'll go through. We're coming up on 730. So I'll just, I'll just go through. Anybody has any questions and I'll start. Uh, the opposite way of the last time. Stephen, I'll start with you. Any questions? Stephen? Okay, Trace? Uh, yes, Trace. Um, 
the impressive accomplishments for the year with both COVID and uh, the wildfires, and you still had a lot of resources to do some other very useful things. So thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, for the ambassador program, uh, do you have any evidence or any observations informally that the uh, ambassadors made a change, either positive or negative, uh, to park visitor behavior? Well, what I would say is our rangers said that people, there was a lot more compliance with the, with the park ambassadors at the trailheads during, during the busy weekends. So we don't, we have not yet crunched all the numbers to see, you know, whether our dogs on leash were, you know, whether we had better compliance for dogs on leash and that sort of thing. Um, or we don't have yet, you know, all the records of how many tickets we gave this year. So that's a good question. And, and as we crunch those numbers, we can find that out for you. Okay, thank you. Second question for the wildlife bridges. Uh, do you have any evidence that the, um, uh, bridges are having the uh, desired effect of reducing mortality in the ditches? Well, since they've just been installed, the, um, we don't have that evidence yet, but two things. We will have that from Northern Colorado because they keep track of that. And secondly, we're gonna put game cameras up on the bridges to see how much they're used, which is really useful. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Paula. Um, yeah, thanks, Therese. This is really an interesting and informative. And um, my, my uh, uh, thanks go out, especially to your rangers, the volunteer rangers, but your staff rangers. I mean, both with the COVID and the, um, the fire. I mean, just remarkable work and really hard, hard work, too. So um, I think they, they all did just an amazing amount of work. Um, in terms of possible field trip areas, I would love to see some of the Ohio fire areas. Um, I've, I've hiked the um, Picture Rock Trail on the backside up to into the burn area a little bit, but that's just fascinating to see up close and with the, having you guys interpret what we're seeing would be really useful and informative, I think so. Um, but there's so many beautiful properties up high that would also be wonderful to see at some point too. Super. Yeah, maybe we could make, maybe we could um, try and time it and get you out there when the aerial mulch is happening. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Paul. Jen? Hi, oh, yes. Uh, thanks, Teresa, for a great presentation. A uh, couple questions with respect to the increased numbers of use. Um, are we monitoring um, for increased damage? And if we're seeing that, are we assessing how much additional budget we're going to need to sort of manage the additional numbers? Well, um, so we have a pretty rigorous trail, trail monitoring system. It's both our rangers and our rec and facility staff. When they see trails start to widen, they, particularly in seasons where you've got rain and snow and then dry, um, and we do have a pretty rigorous means of closing the trails so that when we see damage starting to happen that we definitely um, try to nip it in the bud and stop people from using them until they're dried out. So as far as, but I'll be honest, Anu White Trail. So Anu White Trail was closed for seven years and you know it's many people's favorite trail. It is just a wonderful trail and it is in a very narrow corridor. When we reopened it, people, one, wanted to get out and see it because they hadn't been out, out there for seven years. And two, it was COVID time. So we had school groups out there. We had just incredible numbers, numbers of people. And we saw ourselves that the trail is wider than it used to be. Now, one good thing about there is it can't get too wide because you have steep drop-offs into the creek and you have cliffs. Um, and our, certainly our plant ecologists and weed staff are looking at impacts like that and trying to figure out what we can do. As far as the budget for, um, for maintaining our trails, I would, um, I would say one thing is great. We, had, we started a stewardship. We now have a stewardship pot of money and Eric can talk about this. 
It's kind of a direct result of our strategic plan, which Ernst is going to talk about. And so we were, we were able, staff were able to put in projects that they were hoping could um, be covered with additional funds. And it includes maintenance and it includes, it basically is water, weeds, wildlife, um, trails projects. So we do have a little extra money coming in 2021 for, to help us with the maintenance. Um, is it enough? Probably not. We, you know, as, as many public land managers know, it's hard to keep up with the demands of the public and the use. But I think that we as an agency have done a good job on conserving area and conservation areas where it's off limits to people and in really um, placing our trails and constructing them well to reduce the damage. Okay, Jen. Heather? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. I always love seeing the updates on everything. Um, and it, I really appreciated seeing the trail ambassadors uh, this summer. I ran into a few of them at the full parking lots and it was great to see them out there interacting and interacting with the visitors. Uh, I would love to visit the Heil properties and, and maybe even a, a field trip to the new kind of toll properties as, as that's going on. And of course the Preble's mouse is, is great. Uh, any, my question is any, any idea when that kind of south side of Heil Ranch will be opening up again? Well, so several things that we're working on. So we lost three major bridges down there and we have to get the heli helicopter mulching done. So one of the big questions that we have is, so we have been out there working really hard removing the hazardous trees. So if you've been on Picture Rock onto Wild Turkey, you probably have seen some of the hazard tree work. Well, that it's tenfold we needed you know that much more in the south side of the property where it was burned more severely so we have to get that done our helicopter applications we are aiming to get done by the first of june before the monsoon and then kind of a just you know kind of the background is we need to make internal decisions do you replace those three bridges now or do you wait and see how effective the aerial mulching is? Because we know from the 2013 floods and from the Four Mile Fire and from the Overland Fire that after a fire, we can expect floods. So we would hate to put in a brand new bridge and then have it washed out in a flood because the soil is so unstable above it. So those sorts of, sorts of things are all going into our thought process. We would love to have it open, you know, in the summer, but I would say there's really, you know, no guarantees. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks. Yeah, gosh, you know these these presentations are always so impressive of the body of work that the team um, and open space are in charge of. I guess if the you know rest of my colleagues are interested, maybe this is a retreat question. But you know, looking at those um, use percentages and the increases, I guess I would be curious to learn as we look into 2021 and COVID is gonna be with us for a bit longer, you know, does staff, what, what increases does staff anticipate for use and how are you planning for use management specifically around parking um, for, for 2021? I think that's an excellent question. I would love for you guys to discuss it. It is something that we, we are trying to crack that nut because um, in all of our visitor surveys, what we find is that people are not, don't feel crowded once they get out on the trail. And I'm sure many of you have had that experience. The parking lot is jam packed, but then you get out and you walk for a mile and then you're, you just, you, you just don't feel crowded. We don't have, so, so it's our big issue is parking in particular. Yeah. And, and, and to your point, I'll ask Renata to make a note that we should probably for a retreat topic, that would be uh, something I spent all day. Monday with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. And the question was, is what, what does Georgia's uh, parks look like uh, after COVID? And uh, that, that was a lively conversation. So I think we, something along those lines would be good for the retreat. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, Scott Miller, Scott, do you have anything? Um, just a quick comment. Um, it was great to see the results you guys were having with uh, Rejuvra 
which I, is the new label version of Esplanada. I think that's what it used to be called, or the old ver the other version of it. Um, and especially too, because it's not just a benefit to your to the native grasslands, but it'll, it's labeled for all the all the normal pastures for cattle and things like that too. So it should help with controlling cheat grass across all the ag properties on open space too. Exactly. It just got that grazing label last summer, or maybe September. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Hey, Tony, how's dinner? And do you have a question? <laughs> dinner was fantastic. <clears throat> and uh, Therese, thank you for a great presentation. It was super informative. Um, a couple of thoughts. One, I'd love to learn more about Indian Mountain and some of our efforts towards uh, I'll just call it broadly repatriation, but thinking about how our lands are used by the native peoples here. And I don't know, Jim, if that's a possible retreat topic, but I'd certainly love to learn more. Yeah. Um, the, the places I'd love to see, Therese, if possible, would be that uh, fish stream restoration project in the St. Brain yeah. mm -hmm. and um, the Zaps uh, property over by Hygiene. Um, and I'm just curious, I know in the old meeting notes, there was a, I think Scott actually asked if the house was going to be torn down or used. And I, I didn't see, I, I just didn't look through enough notes to find out what maybe happened with that. I was curious. So that's a good question for, um, for Carol Beam, who will be giving you a presentation sometime soon. We have a whole team that helps try and determine what, uh, what properties are worthy of saving and restoring. You know, we've got well over 300 historic structures on parts and open space throughout our system. So um, I think no final decision has been made on whether we're gonna keep it, restore it to have it so someone can live in or restore it, you, you know, for just for, you know, Historical. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, I don't have any questions other than, uh, I don't know how to find the courthouse anymore. So, when we do get out of COVID, I think we should just like for six months go on a tour of Boulder County. <laughs> but uh, no, I think we, I think the, any, any and all properties, uh, once we get to, to warmer weather and, and maybe we all get vaccinated would be a, would be a great thing this summer. And, uh, and well, just when you do find your way back to the courthouse, I don't think you're going to recognize the hearing room there. It's in the process of being remodeled right oh, now. So it'll right. be a new <laughs> What the heck? Why not? Why not? All right. Well, listen, yeah. thank you. And is and uh, Nick, is there any questions or comments from the public? Hi there. My, it's actually Galen Davis. I'm Nancy Davis's daughter. Um, I live off of Lookout Road. Um, I had a question about Rainbow Open Space. Um, it's my understanding that the open space funds were used to buy this property and it's now going to be completely plowed over and have massive trucks in and out of the property. You spoke about the Preble jumping mouse where it sounded like, you know, the rainbow open space sounds like it would be a great property for it. So I was just wondering why you're so willing to obliterate open space and especially with the biosolids, which are known to be pretty horrific for the environment. So, um, what what uh, Galen is referring to, thank you for that question, Galen. Um, what Galen is referring to is a property that we purchased uh, on 287 north of Lookout, south of Highway 52, and it's called the Rainbow Tree Nursery. It's a property that we purchased a conservation easement on when it was a commercial nursery back in 1994. And then we bought the fee interest uh, in 19, in 2018, and we bought the fee interest because we thought it had good potential to help forward Boulder County's zero waste goals. And the reason that it is appealing for, uh, for having a compost facility on it, which is what is currently making its way through our community planning and permitting process, it hasn't been approved yet. And the reason is because it, um, it is an old nursery. The trees are overgrown. They were just abandoned by the nursery owners, basically. So they're root bound and constrained. They can't grow into a beautiful forest. They're non-native. Majority of the trees are non-native. A lot of fruit trees. A lot of, a lot of them are ash trees, which are 
prone to emerald ash borer and our horticulturists have said we need to take those ash trees out. The other thing is it is far away from Preble's habitat. The, our farthest east Preble's habitat is on 75th Street, so west of the Diagonal Highway. This is a property that's been um, farmed for 140 years, so it's uh, it it has um, it has certainly been impacted, including having a commercial nursery on it. So when we purchased the property, the idea was, um, could it be used to further the county's goals of creating compost, diverting, um, diverting organic waste from our landfills, reducing our greenhouse gases, and giving our farmers, it's in the heart of our farming community, giving our farmers um, access to reasonably priced compost so that we could meet our soil health and um, carbon sequestration goals. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Therese. Thanks for the question. Um, is there any other, Nick, any other public comments or questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Therese. At this time, we will uh, move to uh, Ernst and the Parks and Open Space Internal Strategic Plan. Uh, Ernst, are you with us this evening? I am. Um, right. Let me just get pulled up by. You all set to go? Presentation here, yes, just a second. Uh, so good evening, everybody. For, for those that don't know me, it's been a while since I've presented to POSAC. Uh, I'm Ernst Strang. I'm a, a senior planner with Parks and Open Space. I've worked for the department for about 13 years. And tonight I am going to be presenting on an internal strategic plan that we've been working on for the past couple of years as a department. Uh, there's going to be a lot of information, a lot of details I'm going to go over tonight. Uh, so definitely stop me if a if you need to have questions or, or need some clarification as we're going through this. Uh, and then we'd be interested definitely at the end to get your feedback and any input you have on, on the process that we led, the, fr the framework that we're using and, and, and kind of how we're implementing it moving forward. Um, we could also dive into this, this topic a little bit more in more depth at the retreat, the post-act retreat, if that's a, of interest uh, in doing so. And hey, the, 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 Hey, it's just one point of order. I'll give you. I'll give you a heads up when it's about eight fifteen, just so give okay. you the time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and as as I think others have mentioned, or Teresa and Janice have both mentioned throughout the, the their presentations, uh, each of our work groups are going to be coming to POSAC over the coming year. So you'll hear more, in more detail from each individual work group as we move forward. So I'm going to kind of give more of a high level uh, overview tonight. Um, this is just a quick breakdown of my presentation, give a little background information as well as talk about our outcomes uh, so far to date and then talk about the implementation of this plan. And with that, I wanna jump right into the int introduction background. And so um, for this, we'll um, I'll kind of go over some of the purpose and need and review uh, the process and, and framework that we use. So, so, I mean, you've heard from Janice and Therese tonight, uh, there's a lot, a lot going on in our department. You know, we've been acquiring and managing open space properties and resources since the mid 1970s. Uh, we have protected nearly 105,000 acres of land, including about 65,000 acres in fee and 39,000 acres under conservation easements. And this is spread out over about 1800 different parcels. Um, kind of as a result of these acquisitions and definitely from the support of our Boulder County taxpayers, we've, we've been able to do many things over the, the last several decades. Um, some, some of those things include uh, leading about 500 different public education programs annually, kind of not in the COVID era, but usually pre-COVID, we were leading about 500 programs. Uh, we have our agricultural uh, program that, that you know, works with 72 different tenants to, to maintain agricultural lands on, on, in Boulder County. As Therese described, uh, we've protected and restored important habitats across uh, diverse ecosystems landscapes, including our forested lands, our shrublands, grasslands, and wetland and riparian areas. And, and that helped to, to support uh, the 1,500, 1500 um, native plant species that inhabit Boulder County, as well as the 750 native wildlife species that inhabit Boulder County. We've also, I think Therese mentioned this, um, a little bit about our cultural resources. We've recorded more than 1,800 cultural resource sites and isolated finds on county open space and have preserved um, more than 350 uh, historic buildings and structures uh, across our, our properties. Uh, we also administer a water, a large water portfolio that's valued at about $300 million. We have ownership in 90 ditches, 
We have over 55 water rights and of course a numerous uh, reservoirs and, and ditches that we need to manage. We've constructed and maintained over 120 miles of trail, 32 trailheads, 22 restrooms, 15 shelters and numerous other recreational facilities, including the Boulder County Fairgrounds. Uh, we attend to nearly uh, 2 million visitors annually uh, to ensure their safety as well as their enjoyment of open space and the protection of, of sensitive resources. Uh, we work with over 3,000 volunteers and partners annually. And as, as Janice mentioned, we work with private landowners on over 800 conservation easements. So there's definitely a lot that, that we do, a lot that goes on in our department. Uh, and all that's to, to, to kind of steward these open space resources that we've protected over the past several decades. In addition to, to kind of the open space and the land and waters that we protect, there's these other three other work groups or divisions within our department. We have the Boulder County Fairgrounds, which of course hosts the annual fair, but also is, is booked consistently throughout the year for a number of other events, such as you know, the farmer's market, trade shows, uh, some um, uh, festivals, animal and livestock exhibitions, and, and a number of other things. So it's always busy at the fairgrounds. Uh, we have the Boulder County Youth Corps, uh, which does a lot of work on open space, but um, you know that the Youth Corps, its main mission is to provide employment opportunity for, for the youth of Boulder County with a kind of a community service focus. And then finally, we also have the Boulder County Colorado State University Extension within our, our department. Uh, and they provide educational uh, opportunities for the public, members of the public, and also provide uh, cutting edge research and information around agriculture, horticulture, uh, family and computer, uh, family and consumer sciences, and then they have the 4-H program uh, also. So as many of you probably know or may know, you know we have about 140 full-time equivalent staff uh, that work at, at Parks and Open Space, and, and then we also hire on uh, many, many seasonals throughout the year to help us manage all of our various resources. We have nine different divisions, which are kind of the green the row of green there uh, that show the different divisions as well as the directors, which also includes the director's office. And within that, we have 25 different work groups. And the work groups are kind of like what Therese was describing when she was talking about plant ecology or wildlife or forestry. They're, they're kind of specialists in a, in a unique topic uh, that, that that's their role and responsibility in the department is to try to manage for those, re for those specific things. So we have different staff that are stewarding the resources, including the natural, cultural, agricultural, and recreational resources of our department. Um, we have staff that are leading uh, educational, volunteer, partnership, and other programs. And then we have a number of staff who, who their job is to, to really provide the essential services that kind of keep, keep the whole place running, whether that be through planning, design, and administration, uh, public information and engagement, the HR process of hiring and, and timekeeping and employee de development. We have contracts and leases, reservations and special uses on open space, the financial systems, you know, keeping, uh, paying the bills, doing the accounting, uh, receiving and managing grants. Um, we also have GIS and technology that, that you know, creates our maps and, and, and has our, our, our applications that we use and, and databases. And then finally, the, the shop also, you know, it's very important to have vehicles and equipment that work as well as a working uh, uh, yard. Uh, for, for storing equipment and so forth. So, so definitely I'm just trying to get across to you that there's a lot going on, there's lots of staff, everyone's kind of chipping away at, at different projects, uh, numerous and diverse projects and all you know, trying to help steward the resources and, and engage with the public um, and all that they do. You know, we definitely, we've been very successful as a department as you, as you all know, and as you can always see when, when you probably come to a post-act meeting, uh, you know, we have those ingredients for success. We have a, a great mission that's, that's uh, derived primarily from the Boulder County Comp Plan, um, the multidisciplinary staff, and you know, Therese and Janice both mentioned many of their staff members. Um, you know, they're very dedicated, all of our staff are very dedicated, they're passionate. They bring a lot of knowledge and skills and expertise to all that they do. And so that, that helps us do a lot of stuff. Uh, we also have uh, good funding sources. We get some money from the general fund as well as our dedicated open space sales taxes and the, the number of grants that we, we receive. And finally, I think another ingredient to the success is the public. You know, we have a very supportive and engaged public uh, that, that really loves open space and the programs that we lead. So I think that's been, been very helpful. But I think with that, you know, as, as 
Therese went through all her different projects. It was just making me think about it. Man, there's a, there's a lot that we do. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that we could be doing in addition. You know, there's always things to, to be working on. Uh, and in many cases, there's also stuff that we must do, you know, stuff like the flood restoration projects. We have to go back in and monitor those year after year uh, for a number of years after the project's all is, you know, presumably over. We think it's over, but it's not really. There's lots of stuff to do and lots of stuff that we must do. We also know that a lot of the resources that we steward um, aren't always in the state we want or need them to be, um, such as the forest um, and, and other, other natural resources. Um, that, that's also true for our recreational resources, our trails. We talked about, you talked a little bit about trail maintenance and the needs for that. So there's always, always these different things that are, are out there that needs to be done. Uh, in terms of our programming that we lead, you know, we're not always reaching or, or benefiting the whole community. That's also been brought up tonight, you know, working with the Latinx community or the American Indian community. How can we do that better? And, and how can we make the impacts that we're trying to, that we're hoping to achieve? And finally, I just say that the, you know, the service we provide, um, you know, always can be fine-tuned. Uh, you know, we can better serve the whole community. We can better assist staff in, in helping them to get done what, the, what they need to get done uh, in, in, their, in their specialty. In addition, I think the coordination of all these different activities and, and kind of the collaboration across the, the department can be kind of tricky. We, again, we have nine divisions, 140 staff, lots of people doing lots of different things. And so one of the things that we try to do is just to avoid working in our in what we call the silos. So that just, you know, individual work groups are kind of just focused on their own thing without necessarily thinking or engaging with, with other staff. So that's that's always a challenge just to avoid those silos. Um, and regardless, there's always room for improvement. You know, how, how do we how do we decide where to put our efforts? Um, how do we manage our limited staff capacity and financial resources? How do we best coordinate our efforts and avoid these silos and work better together? And how can we ensure we're moving forward uh, towards the outcomes we are trying to achieve and being intentional and proactive uh, in our approaches? And that's really got to get at the, the purpose and need for, for this internal strategic plan. You know, again, just kind of saying there's lots that, that, that is going on, lots that we can do, a lot of resources that we need to steward, a lot of programs we can lead, et cetera. Um, but we need to make sure that you know we're being strategic in our approach moving forward and so I think the purpose you know the primary purposes of the strategic plan are, are up there right now um, you know is to provide staff with clarity focus and direction in what they're they're doing help them to prioritize the work and help in our decision making framework in terms of staffing and funding and resourcing various projects it's also been a the intent of it is to improve staff collaboration coordination uh, and, and enhance the overall departmental operations and administration. And finally, it's to, to achieve the desired future conditions for the resources we steward, programs we lead, and the services we provide to the public and each other. And that, that idea of the desired future conditions really is the, um, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see it <laughs> moving forward here as I described the strategic plan. That's kind of been our, our, our main topic and, and main focus of, of the plan is to create desired future conditions. Um, so I'm going to go over the, the framework that we used as well as the process. It's, it, we've been doing working on this for the past two years. Um, we've uh, engaged all staff at every level uh, throughout the process, trying to, to um, you know, utilize their, their, their knowledge and their uh, skills and their um, expertise on, in their various work groups uh, and bring that um, to the forefront. So starting at the, the beginning of the, the planning process, uh, we, I found a definition on the web about uh, strategic planning, and, and I'm just going to read it uh, to you. That, that definition is a systematic process of envisioning a desired future and translating this vision into broadly defined goals and objectives and a sequence of steps to achieve them. So based on that definition, I created this uh, model for our staff to kind of help help us understand what we're trying to do. And what it is is that we, you know, for, for any of our resources, our programs, our services, we have a kind of a current state of affairs of how things are now. And that we also know that there's some desired future condition or outcome that we're trying to achieve in all of our work. And so trying to figure out how do we get from our current state of affairs to that desired future condition or that outcome and what strategy should we be utilizing to get there? And so this has been a process where we can define that desired future condition and then also think about 
you know, what is the best way to, to move forward um, into the future. This is a little bit more of a detailed framework that, that really became the kind of the backbone of our strategic plan. Um, and it provides kind of the definitions and kind of the process that we use um, throughout the, the process and we'll be using moving forward. And so each work group, again, there's about 25 of them, came up with, with a desired future condition statement uh, for their various resources, programs and services that they provide. And uh, how we define that is, you know, the desired future condition or what we call DFC is what we want to achieve for their for those resources, programs, or services. And another way to think about it is it's our target or our North Star that guides us in, in what we do. Uh, under that DFC statement, we created, a, each group created a number of goals, which we defined as what we need to do to achieve the desired future condition, kind of at a higher level. Um, so many, most groups have about four to six goals that they created uh, for their work groups. Uh, and then the next, Kind of moving down is the strategies, and that's really the how uh, of what we're doing and how we plan to accomplish our, our goals and, and move us closer to our desired future condition. And then finally is the objectives, and we've uh, put those as smart objectives, uh, being specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. And, and these are, are really specific actions that, that each work group is going to take towards the strategy and moving them towards their goals and DFCs. Uh, and, and, and in that case, that this becomes Part of, part of the work group's work plan uh, for a given time period. You know, ultimately, uh, this process has been focused on, on two primary questions. And those questions are, are we doing the right things, which is kind of the what, and are we doing these things right, which is the how. And so we kind of look at the desired future condition and goals as the what, and the strategy and objectives as the how, how we're doing things. As I mentioned before, we did have, you know, we engaged all staff through this process. Uh, in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, I, let, I met with each of the work groups and uh, did a facilitate, some facilitated discussions with them where we talked about their roles and responsibilities, their current state of affairs, their desired future conditions, and did a little bit of a strengths, weaknesses, um, opportunities and threats or SWOT analysis uh, with the groups. Uh, so we did that early in 2019. And then from there, we, we worked uh, with each individual work group on creating their desired future condition statements as well as their goals. In 2020, um, we focused more on the strategies and the objectives uh, and, um, and then also kind of creating the process for prioritizing uh, some projects for some funding. And I believe it was Therese that mentioned the stewardship fund and I'll talk about that in just a little bit and, and we created a process to, to, to help prioritize where we put that funding. This year in 2021, um, you know, we're moving into more implementation of the strategic plan, uh, getting, you know, having folks, our staff uh, start working on the objectives that they set out um, and kind of just fine tuning the process in general as we move along. And I think this, the process has evolved over this, these two years and it will continue to evolve over time. Um, so I wanna go over some of the, the high level outcomes of the plans. So I'm gonna talk about four things, the operating principles, uh, strategic themes, core groups, and then a little bit about the work group strategic uh, plans. Uh, for that, that last part, the work groups, again, we'll have the work groups come uh, to POSAC throughout the year to kind of talk about their DFCs, goals, uh, strategies, and objectives. So you'll hear from each of the different work groups. So the operating principles are um, a somewhat new concept for our department. Um, there are guiding uh, value statements for the county as a whole, but these operating principles are a little bit more specific to uh, parks, the Parks and Open Space Department. And many of them uh, came, came out as we kind of did the discovery, the initial phases of, of, of the, the planning and met with each of the work groups and kind of just through our conversations, there was, we just felt like there were certain things that were rising to the top that kind of were department-wide um, topics. And so the, the operating pr principles are, what they, what they are is that they provide uh, some overall values for the department and pr provide a foundation of who we are and what we do. And the idea is that staff will use these uh, to guide, guide the development and implementation of their various projects, programs, and services. So I'm gonna go through these really quickly in the next uh, three slides. Um, um, and so, uh, each of these, so we have the statement, the Parks and Open Space Department, dot, dot, dot. And so then each of these statements could be 
uh, follow that, that, that uh, statement. So uh, the first one is that Parks and Open Space Department is welcoming, inclusive, and equitable in all that it does. Um, the next one is around creating meaningful experiences for the community while maintaining the integrity of our resources in the land and water. Uh, third one is around building stewardship um, for our various resources uh, through our programs and projects. Next one is around collaborating, uh, you know, collabor collaboration around amongst staff, but also with other county departments, partner organizations, and the community as a whole, and making sure we're making informed decisions using the best available science, adaptive management, and community input. The next one is around being transparent and fully accountable and using professional practices and in procedures and in, in our work. Uh, the next one is, is uh, states that we apply staff and funding resources equitably, equitably, efficiently, and effectively to achieve our desired future conditions and goals. The next is around involving volunteers, youth, and service groups in meaningful work and projects that foster uh, an equitable community as well as a healthy environment. Next one is around we represent the many values and perspectives of our various disciplines while uh, and still recognize the importance of effective and harmonious teamwork in trying to reach consensus and, and, and having a coordinated communication about our work. Uh, the next one is we recognize the effects of climate change on our community and the environment and, and work to, to address uh, the, those impacts. Next is the Parks and Open Space Department works holistically and regionally in service of the natural and human communities. Um, Next is around prioritizing the safety of both staff members as well as the public and making sure that safety is, is one of our highest priorities uh, in all that we do. Then we have uh, the Parks and Open Space Department cultivates excellence in its work by supporting staff development uh, and learning. We pro promote open and positive communication and uh, utilize a constructive supervision and encourage staff involvement in what we do. And finally, the last operating principle is around celebrating the many accomplishments of our department as well as the community and um, recognizing uh, the roles of staff, the county partners and the public in those accomplishments. So that's one aspect of the strategic plan that is, is kind of new and that'll be, these will be uh, again, you know, used by staff in, in guiding their work. Um, the next uh, topic is strategic themes and these are, um, I'll show, show them to you in a sec. We have four strategic themes, but these are again, were things that kind of came out through our discussions, looking at uh, among staff, looking at our desired future conditions and our goals and seeing that there are certain things that just rise to the top and, and that we have multiple work groups that, that you know, this is part of what they're trying to accomplish. And so in that way, we think of them as the common threads that kind of tie together the mission of our department, as well as the DFCs and goals of our work groups. And it kind of answers the question, you know, as a department, what are we trying to accomplish? And in that sense, they provide kind of an overarching priority uh, for the department. And so the four uh, strategic themes are shown here on the screen. And I'll, and I'll go ahead and read, read through those. The first one is around community. And the theme is that we will continue to seek innovative ways to build support for and trust in the department, connect people with the land, water, and cultures of Boulder County, and inspire stewardship of our shared resources. So working with the community uh, in all that we do. The next is around stewardship. And this gets into the, the number of resources that we manage. Again, whether they be natural resources, cultural resources, recreational resources, or agricultural resources. We wanna make sure that we manage and maintain the properties, resources, and amenities that the county has invested in to keep them in good or better condition for current and future generations. Really recognizing that we've you know, spent lots of money and time and effort that developing this system, we wanna make sure that it's, it's, it's there for, not only for us, but for those uh, to come. The next one is something that we've talked, you've heard a little bit uh, about tonight. Uh, um, and it's something that we're putting a lot more emphasis on as a department and that's cultural responsiveness and inclusion. And the uh, theme states that we ensure all our programs, amenities and services are welcoming, inclusive and culturally responsive to all particularly those in our community that have been traditionally underserved and marginalized. And as you, I think has been brought up uh, tonight and probably in the past, we have been working on a cultural responsiveness and inclusion strategic plan. I've been helping to lead that process, working with consultants, and we're hoping to bring that plan to you at the retreat um, coming up. So you can hear a little bit more from our consultants as well as staff 
um, what, what, our, what that looks like. And the final theme is around resilience. And this is plan for, mitigate, and respond with agility to environmental, social, economic, and climate change. Uh, we've also heard about this tonight with the wildfires and the floods uh, and the pandemic. Uh, we've also weathered re recessions and, and different things. So I think you know, this idea is that you know, there are, there's always gonna be change out there uh, and we're gonna be um, you know, plan for, mitigate and respond to, to those changes uh, moving forward. So those are the strategic themes. Uh, the next topic is around core groups uh, and has been mentioned I heard this also earlier tonight is that, you know, we do a lot of things in interdisciplinary teams or multidisciplinary teams in our department uh, so that we bring together uh, different perspectives and, and different voices. Um, the idea of the core groups is very similar to that. It's, it's bringing together different disciplines, uh, but these are um, bringing together different work groups that have very similar desired future conditions and goals uh, in, in getting them together kind of in a proactive and intentional way to kind of, uh, you know, not only break down the silos between them, but also to uh, increase some collaboration and, and maybe synergy among the groups to kind of work towards some shared goals. So instead of being very project specific, these, this, these groups are, are um, you're gonna be tackling uh, issues and challenges that, that each of these groups face, um, and try to come up with some solutions and, and, and ultimately it's trying to work better together, having more voices together, working on things. And so there's four core groups that we have uh, developed through the strategic planning process. Um, the four groups, and you can see underneath the core groups are the work groups that are engaged in those. I won't go through each of those, but we have a public amenities and infrastructure group, a community group, a land and water group, and an organizational stewardship group. And so for each of these groups, um, we spent uh, met several times uh, in 2020 um, to kind of reflect on uh, you know what is it that each of these groups you know where where is kind of the overlap in in what each of these groups are trying to accomplish and what are some of the challenges and opportunities um, that they face and that we maybe can can uh, benefit from and so each group developed what we called a joint target uh, which is very similar to the desired future condition it's it's what uh, what that group would like to achieve together. And then from that uh, joint proposal, which describes how they plan uh, to, to work together towards that joint target. And so we kind of did that kind of initial work in 2020 and moving forward, we're going to be tackling those joint proposals. Uh, and just to kind of give you a little bit of background on each of them in terms of the joint target, I won't go into all the details about it, but the public amenities and infrastructure group is their main focus is going to be on the main, what we call the maintenance backlog. You know, lots of projects that kind of get put in on the back burner when there's, you know, emergencies to take care of or new projects to build. Um, you know, we have a, a number of, you know, whether it's our trails or trailheads or ag infrastructure, water infrastructure, there's a lot of maintenance needs that are out there. And so we're going to try getting a better handle on those in the coming years. Uh, the community group is, is, will be, these are groups that, you know, work directly with the community, uh, members of the public, and, and we're trying to bring these groups, this, these groups together uh, to kind of ma help manage that community engagement and education uh, with a unified voice and, and trying to find, you know, again, find ways to work better together uh, on, you know, work with, as, as we work with the community. The land and water group is, is of course, thinking about kind of the natural resource base of, of our open space program. And their joint target uh, involves improving and sustaining the ecological function of our lands, water, and species. Uh, you know, to, to to make sure that our land and water are sustainable uh, into the future. And finally, the organizational stewardship group is more internally focused, but it's it's thinking about our organization and how do we, you know, how do we manage it and um, thinking about some of the essential tasks and processes and uh, practices and procedures that we have uh, in kind of you know, whether it's creating those or at least documenting them uh, and making sure that uh, our staff understand them and that we're you know, doing things effectively and efficiently. Um, and ultimately that we're working on projects and programs and services uh, that are kind of tied to the strategic plan and, and the work that we've done. 
So again, I'm not going to go uh, into too much detail with work groups, but this is actually where most of the work for the strategic plan um, occurred. And, and really, this is because this the work groups is where the work gets done. <laughs> uh, these are the, the folks that are out on the ground, meeting with the public, working with our resource, you know, the land and the water, uh, and, and, and doing uh, doing the work and, and um, for parks and open space. And we want to just make sure that that each of these is a center of excellence and that they have you know, clear direction and focus on what it is they're trying to achieve and how they plan to do it. Uh, so um, myself and, and Tina Nielsen worked with each of these work groups um, over the last couple of years, again, writing the desired future conditions and the goals, and then this past year working on strategies and, and setting up the smart objectives. And again, throughout 2021, these groups will be uh, coming to you to kind of present their strategic plans, and you can uh, kind of dive into some, some more of the details for each of those. So in terms of <clears throat> implementation of the plan, um, there's there's um, many ways we will be doing this. Um, you know, the first is really around prioritization, uh, kind of at, at a department-wide level, the core group level, and the work group level. It's again, it's trying to decide, you know, what what projects should we be tackle, tackling uh, and what kind of gets the highest priorities. Um, and so uh, um, you kind of see there how, how that's broken down. I mean, at the department level, it's using the strategic themes and the operating principles. Uh, the core groups will work on towards those joint targets and the work groups will use their strategic plans to kind of help, help guide their work uh, moving into the future. Uh, the strategic plan will also, with that prioritization, will also be used to help with funding. Uh, so most, I think, if not all work groups or divisions have an operating operation and maintenance fund that they can use to kind of manage the, their work, um, some of their, their basic uh, job duties and, and, and tasks that need to be accomplished. Um, so part of this is to, to better understand what, what, what is the budget that they need for, for the various resources that they're stewarding and the programs that they're leading and services they're providing. And so Part of this is trying to right size those operation and maintenance budgets, which haven't, for many, if not most, work groups haven't changed much over the, the, the years. And especially as we continue to add properties and, and resources and, and you know, uh, obligations, um, we'd like to use this to help right size those budgets. Um, you saw Tina came to you last month and, and presented the POSIP or Parks and Open Space um, Improvement Projects which are capital improvement projects. Um, you know, each year we, we have different uh, post-sip category managers and groups meet together to kind of do some prioritization around what it is they're, they're, they need funding for. And so they'll use the strategic plan moving forward to kind of help guide the, those decisions. And then the next one is the stewardship fund. And again, this is a kind of, it's, it's not new money per se, but it's a, it's a new, what we call a bucket of money. Uh, and it's, it's taking our existing open space sales tax money that's um, available for, for doing various projects on open space and kind of putting it into a, a fund uh, that um, individual work groups can tap into. Um, we've kind of created a process this past year of having, uh, you know, if, if, if work groups wanted to need it, some stewardship fund, they would put together a project charter, which kind of lays out the scope of work and the timeline and, uh, you know, who else they need to collaborate with, those types of things. And then um, we got a number of uh, project charters from different staff members. And of course, there's limits to that funding. So we ended up creating some uh, criteria uh, for ranking those project requests or, steward or stewardship fund requests. Um, and so that's kind of a new process for us and, and staff is kind of getting used to it and we're all kind of uh, fine tuning it as we go. Uh, and finally, I think, you know, the other funding sources are grants, um, various grants that we get. And that, again, the strategic plan can be used to help, you know, once we prioritize projects and needs, you know, it, it helps us to know where we should go to apply for grants. The other aspect, you know, for the staff is, or for the department is, is around staffing. You know, as I've been mentioning, I mean, this is about trying to increase some collaboration and coordination, but it's also about trying to better manage, determine and manage our staff capacity and knowing that there's so many things going on and, and you know, um, and sometimes staff, you know, 
don't have the time to, to, to put towards uh, certain projects, et cetera. And so it's just, it's trying, we're trying to, and this is something that we need to work on more in the coming years, but how do we better understand what projects there are, what staff need to be involved, how much time do they have to put towards those projects and, and that type of thing. So, so I think the strategic plan will help with that uh, staff, the staffing issues. One of the things we did, you know, I guess throughout the whole process, you know, kind of been documenting a lot of the stuff that we've heard from staff. And then um, this past fall, we had a, a meeting of supervisors and a few other staff members. And we kind of took a lot of those ideas that we are, a lot of the things we heard from staff throughout the process and the areas for improvement, you created, created a list and had, had uh, the, the uh, people that participated in the meeting uh, check off areas where they think, you know, the highest needs are uh, for areas for improvement. And uh, so this kind of shows you these, these have been ordered in, in um, you know, after the, the, the rank, after the, uh, that meeting from highest to lowest. So definitely there's a need around, you know, uh, maintaining and managing our resources and assets. Uh, this gets to kind of, again, what we, I mentioned before, the, the maintenance backlog. Uh, so that's definitely something on, on staff members' minds. Uh, the other, some other things are around project management and how do we better manage projects from start to finish uh, and have the skills and tools uh, and support for that. And so we're going to be, uh, we're just starting to put some thought behind that and, and provide some training and, and maybe try to uh, provide some better tools for staff to use in their project management to improve the you know, efficiency and effectiveness of our projects. Uh, and then I won't go through this whole list, but also, as I meant, just a little bit ago, time and capacity management is also a big concern for staff. And a lot of staff feel like they're putting out fires a lot, kind of dealing with the issue of the day, and um, and are also just kind of uh, sometimes overwhelmed with the lots of different projects going on, jumping from one project to the next, and uh, not having a lot of time to be intentional or proactive towards these things. So it's uh, again something that we need to consider as a department and and make some improvements around that. Hey, Ernst, I'll give you the 820 time check. Okay, this, I got two more slides. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> so, you know, I think overall, again, this has been an internal process. You know, it's, it's really trying to figure out how to best serve the public and achieve what the residents of Boulder County have asked us to carry out for them as a department for all these different resources, all the different programs that we lead and services we provide. Uh, we'll continue to engage with the public, POSAC, uh, you know, through any, any of our management plans or policies or other, uh, you know, major project decisions, but all of these will be ultimately tied back to the strategic plan and, and so the various work groups desired future conditions and goals. Uh, and then just one more time, again, we'll be presenting these, uh, uh, the work groups will pre be presenting to you uh, throughout 2021 of, of their individual uh, strategic plan. So with that, I'm going to uh, thank you. I think Eric was going to say a few words. Uh, if that's okay, um, but I will stop sharing my my screen, and then definitely any questions or comments hey, hey, you may have, we'd like to hear. We'll get we'll get we'll get to Eric Ernst. We want to talk to you. <laughs> that's great. Well, I think Eric was going to say a few things about the strategic plan, but uh -oh. definitely yes. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, hey, Ernst. I just have one comment: is that uh, I, I eat I eat, sleep, and drink this for a living with as a venture capitalist. But I will tell you that the best strategic plans to me have always been the ones that are the, the profound simplistic, right? Mm -hmm. So if you tell people what's, if I can stop anybody in an organization and say, what's what's a couple of the goals that your organization this year? And if they can't tell me, I get concerned. And usually the simpler it is, the easier it is for people to get their head around. And the other thing is, I think Ann Overton uh, touched on this. Uh, you know, if you look at your numbers, you just go around the country. It doesn't matter. Look at any any county, state, even the federal feds are uh, the increased participation, the use of trails, the uh, people fighting in Georgia. The big issue is people going at 530 in the morning and saving a parking spot for their friend because by seven o'clock, the parking lots are full. People getting into fist fights over. Uh, who's parking spot, who's, who gets in, who doesn't get in. But anyway, I would add, I would just tell you guys, my only two bits, not a question, just a comment, but I would encourage you all to go through that exercise I did in the beginning of the week. And that is just take your current strategic plan and say, based on COVID, what's different? What, what's changed 
uh, since what we talked about, you started in 19, right? And did some work in 20. So take, don't start over, but take your 19 and 20 work and just say, hey, based on COVID, what's, what's changed? What, what is different? And uh, whether it's the increased participation, it's how we meet, do we have to meet in person? Do we all work in the same spot as a group? Uh, how often is that? Um, how are we gonna communicate if we can't meet face-to-face? -face? All that kind of stuff I think is a good uh, strategic conversation to have. So I'll just leave it at that and I'll shut up and throw it to the others. So uh, Tony Lewis, Tony, I'll start with you. Um, no questions. Super thorough. I, I guess I would echo Jim's comments, which is the best strategic plans I've seen have been simple to articulate and clear about several goals. And it's easy to get caught up into thousands, uh, seemingly thousands of objectives and strategies and tactics. And at the end of the day, you have to have something you can rally people around and it has to be simple enough to do that. So I think you guys are doing good work. Just keep it as simple as possible. Thanks, Tony. Scott Miller? Um, yeah, I have a lot to take in, but I agree with what Tony said, which is that I, it, the best thing to do is, I know there's a lot of different things you guys are trying to wrangle, but the simpler you can keep it to keep everybody focused is probably the best. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Ann? I agree with what's been said, have no further comments, but thank you for the presentation. Yeah, thanks. Heather? Uh, I'd say thank you for the great presentation. And again, just reiterate those previous comments of keeping things simple um, and manageable. Thanks. thanks, Heather. Jen? Nothing specific, just uh, thanks and um, I can't imagine the amount of work that you put into making things simple. <laughs> Incredible amount of work. So good job. Paula? Uh, yeah, just Ernst, um, having gone through far too many of these planning processes in my career, I applaud your effort. It's very, it's grueling to go through that and try to make, reach consensus with everybody and make something comprehensive and understandable and all that. So it looks like you're on a good path and, and I wish you luck. Thank you, Paul. Trace? Um, yeah, Trace Baker here. Uh, thank you, Ernst. Um, when I look over the questions that I wrote down for tonight, uh, most of them have to deal with the organizational stewardship uh, core group. And I see that you may be presenting on that um, on the June meeting. So I'll only bring up one topic here, and that is that um, for project management systems, um, one area that I didn't see discussed, I may have overlooked it, was risk management. And um, I know that Jim talked about uh, risks such as, you know, fire, COVID, flood. Um, and so, you know, if you could, you know, perhaps consider adding uh, some discussion of what can be possibly go wrong and how can it be mitigated. Um, I think that'll be an important part of any strategic planning. Thank you. Super, thanks. Trace, uh, Stephen? You know, this reminds me why I work for myself and have for many years. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for the presentation. I appreciate how hard this must be to go through and your hard work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ernst, for an eighth. Ernst, I appreciate you coming out tonight and spending the time with us. And I'm sure we'll uh, look forward the rest of the year to the other group's presentations and we'll see you again, I'm sure. So thanks much. Thank you. And your friend, Eric, is, did we find Eric? Yeah, I'm here, Jim. Okay, well, because the highlight now, of course, from Longmont, I trust you're in Longmont. Uh, actually, no, I'm on vacation this week uh, and only tuning in for you. Uh, so, uh, in an undisclosed location, we won't pry <laughs> out of you. Right. Well, right. with Ernst giving a presentation on, um, our work on developing an internal strategic plan, uh, I wanted to tune in for that and be available. Um, the one thing I wanted to add, and, and Ernst touched on this in a number of places, um, the part of the process that I'm, um, most pleased about is that we engaged everybody in the department. 
uh, to the degree that they wanted to be engaged in. So Ernst started in early 2019 working with each work group. So the supervisor and the staff in that work group to really get an assessment of what's going on in that work group. And so we built that strategic plan from the sort of foundation of the organization up. And as I've said before, um, and I'll say again, one of the strengths of our department is that we have very robust capacity and expertise. We're always tapped out. There is, oh, there's just literally no end to the work that we can do, but um, to have a department that has expertise and experience in so many of the things that we, we do is a real strength. And we structured the strategic planning effort to try to tap into that from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So um, at, the, at the work group level, which we call kind of the micro level of the department, it really reflects that with every work group now having a clear desired future condition that they built and then brought to me with their division manager to discuss, maybe do some polishing and fine tuning to make it more clear, maybe a little emphasis, but it's really built from the ground up. And um, as many of you have said, and I will point it out, Ernst uh, worked for two solid years on this and Tina spent a considerable amount of her time in 2020 working on this as, as her biggest project. So between Ernst and Tina, they really put their back into it um, along with all of the work groups uh, in particular to, to build it. So pleased with that. And I think you'll see the results of that um, month in and month out over the course of 2021. And you'll get a much more um, detailed perspective of what those work groups are up to, what they're shooting for, and how they plan to get there. So um, more to come on that. And then um, with respect to uh, the director's update, I don't really have one because A, I'm on vacation. B, you got uh, two good updates from the real estate division and the resource management division. Um, and I'm not sure when Al's going to have it on the calendar, but you'll get one from Reckon Facilities reasonably soon too. So that's all there is from Boston. Well, well, in any event, you gave your location away, so I have to delete that. But are, <laughs> I guess the main question is, are you coming back from vacation? I will be. Okay, so we'll plan to see you probably next month. Then. Back next week. Yeah, uh, I'll throw it out to the to the other members. Any any questions for Eric tonight? Or we gonna? I guess we should let you go since you're on vacation, right? Does anybody have anything pressing? Nah, I think so. I think we'll let you go. When are you coming back? I can ask. I'll be back on Tuesday. Oh, okay. Hey, enjoy. Thank you. Uh, any other, anybody else have anything? No. Thank you much. That's my fake hammer. The meeting adjourned. Everybody be safe. We'll see you next month. Thank that everybody. You. Thanks. Thanks.